Yeah, got a new podium too, right? That's what faith will do for you. Yeah. Man, it's heavy too, man. I'm not going to knock it down. <coughs> Is this for me? Y'all trying to tell me something? Amen. <laughs> Amen. How's everybody doing? About six of y'all doing good. How's everybody doing? Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Certainly delighted that uh, you're here. And uh, uh, my prayer for you is, as fathers, that you are in a good relationship with your children. Um, and likewise, we want to be in a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. Um, he is the greatest daddy of them all. So with that, if you're not, if you're not uh, in a good relationship with him, chances are, the rest of your life is going to be pretty fouled up, too. Amen. 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 That's where it starts at. So I want to take an opportunity to welcome, um, turn me up just a little bit, please. Uh, welcome our first-time guests, those of you that have, uh, maybe you've been to the old building and it's your first time here at LifePoint, or maybe this is just your first time here at LifePoint. Welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you for overcoming all the obstacles that you had to overcome, you know, to be here because it can be real challenging in 2018 to go to a church, period. Certainly a church that you've never been to before and maybe even a church that you've heard crazy things about, you know I heard about that church in that hotel. They stay there six hours and I heard about that church. That guy has no off switch, you know uh, You know they swing from the chandeliers and crawl on the walls, you know They put spider-man to shame, you know what I'm saying? But that's a lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff is exaggerated <laughs> You'll just have to figure out what is exaggerated, but we're delighted that you're here We certainly also want to Give a hearty welcome to our YouTube audience. Thank you for tuning in today if you're watching this by live stream or if you're watching it at a later date. We thank you for taking the opportunity to hear the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is not all the other things that go along with it. It is the Word of God that God has used to change your life from the inside out. So get something to write with. Get you a cup of coffee if you're there chilling out. You know, don't chill too much. Don't want you to go to sleep. You know, I don't want these folks going to sleep. Don't want you going to sleep either. But make sure that you hear from the Spirit of God today and just do whatever he says do, and I guarantee you he'll tell you the right thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome our first-time guests and our YouTube audience this morning. Amen. 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 Well, I'm just trying to, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. I'm just uh, feeling my way out here. I uh, got a lot of stuff going on this morning uh, in, in a good sense. I uh, got a lot of information. Um, I'm going to give you what I have time to give you, whatever the allotted time for me is. They'll let me know if I'm going a little long. They'll kind of, you know, let me know and signal me. But I need you. Um, as is the responsibility of every believer to put your faith at, to work this morning and believe God for, say this word, utterance. 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 Say it again, utterance. utterance. Utterance is the spiritual manifestation of truth, biblical truth, that may not necessarily come just by showing up at church or reading your Bible. And so with that, uh, we talked last week, and we've been talking uh, all since we've been here, but... Uh, for our prophetic word for the year since 2018, and that is that we are learning the potential in every seed. Everything in life, everything in life, whether you know it or not or realize it or not, everything in life is based on seeds, everything. Scripturally, I can prove that to you. Jesus says that in the book of uh, Genesis. He says, as long as the earth remains, Father says it, but Jesus was there too, uh, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, harvest right? Harvest. It is a twofold process. Seed time is significant because seeds are what has created absolutely everything. I want you to get a picture in your mind this morning. I'm going to pray and then we'll get into the Word of God. I want you to get a picture in your mind this morning about uh, a container. Would you hand me that right there, please? Hand me that bottle. I don't want to use that one. I'll use this one. <coughs> Thank you. This is a container, correct? Yes. Come on, talk to me. Are you awake this morning? This is a container. It holds something. Yes. Okay? What it holds is, has been determined by the individual that created it. Right? Yes. And so it holds water. Water is necessary for the nourishment of our bodies, for the sustaining of life, and on and on and on. Water doesn't just affect humans. It affects plants. Yes. Right? So water, as a necessary component of life on this planet, has to be in some type of container 
to be valuable. A lake is a container. An ocean is a container. Clouds are containers. Come on, right? So this is a container. It's easily identifiable. But how about understanding that you and I, when we use a word, a word is a container. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and give you praise. To this point, God, we've just enjoyed your presence through praise and worship, through the sacrifice of giving and the fellowship of meeting one another in a place, a safe place, where your anointing and your power can be seen without any embarrassment or out without any hindrances. I come against the spirit of darkness in every manifestation today and tell you that you are bound and subject to the authority of the living God. So you will be silent and you will shut up in this place and you will, if you're going to be in here because somebody allowed you to come in with them, I tell you, you are subject to the authority of this house. So in the name of Jesus, the word of God will come forth freely without hindrance. Lord, you will speak through these lips of clay. Allow my heart and my mind to be clear so I can hear you and speak according to your word. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. If I say to you, if I say the word to you, dog, how many of you know what a dog is? Anybody that doesn't know what a dog is? (laughs) My young friend over here is sitting next to his pop is like, even I get that one. Okay? You know what a dog is. Now, when I say dog, I ain't say cat. I said dog. I'm a dog person. I ain't no cat person. No offense about your cat. I ain't got no problem with that. I'm just talking dog. When I say dog, you get the image of the last dog or the dog that you have in your heart. Now, if I say big dog, okay? Another image applies, right? If I say big black dog, it's starting to bring that whole thing into better clarity. Big black dog with no tail. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Words, words are not intended, now stay with me now, words are not intended so much to communicate with as they are to visualize with. God used his words in the beginning. God was not communicating. He wasn't... Okay, I don't get ahead of myself. He wasn't communicating with the earth to get the earth to do what he wanted it to do. What he was doing was he was visualizing so that those that needed the necessary power of God, who is the power of God? Who is the power of God? Come on, yes, I like you don't know that. The Holy Spirit is the power of God, the active power of God, still to this, till to this day. So when he says light, he's not defining light. He is calling forth what he has already seen on the inside of himself. That's why it's important not to call yourself broke. Because broke as a word is a descriptive and it causes a vision in our lives of what we're eventually going to be. Come on now. Ugly. When people use words, if you're standing in a room and somebody says something disparaging against you and they say, well, I don't like your color, and they might call you outside of your name or your color, it is up to you and I to determine whether or not what they say has any value in our hearts. I don't care what they call me, I know who I am. I've been given a name that I didn't have any say-so in, My name was given to me, so when they call my name, there might be somebody else in the room with the same name, right? So when I hear my name, all of a sudden attention is grabbed because I recognize that that is a a moniker, if you will, or a title that I can be identified by. However, if they call me something that does not associate itself with my knowledge base because I change I know who I am. You can't call me, you're a dog, and me answer. Because I ain't a dog. Amen. Now, I am a lot of the things that, that, that I describe to you that a dog is. I'm big. I'm black. Come on. And I have no tail. Who said that? <laughs> I have no tail. But I am not a dog. Do you see the difference? When God, when God equipped us as, as humans, every human has the same capacity in them. It's whether or not you know it. 
And let's take it to the next level, whether or not you use it. And I submit to you that what has happened over the years, we as um, humans, humans that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, so you become a Christian. Christians that accept Jesus and then decide that they want to move uh, closer to Jesus then become believers. And then, this, is, this is the way Jesus laid it out. I'm just, you know. Then those believers that want to devote their complete lives to him, then they become disciples. Not everybody is a Christian. Not every Christian is a believer. Not every believer is a disciple. Come on now. Now, we say that we serve Christian, believer, disciple, we serve the same Lord. She just read it over in Ephesians, right? There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord who is Lord all in all. With that understanding, what we have to recognize then is why is it, Pastor Tommy, that I have not grown since I became a Christian? Can I simplify it for you? It's your fault. You have as much of God today as you want. And people need to come up, and this is the way we teach. Those of you, I might use the phrase, pulling your religious toes. It simply means stop thinking like you know what you, you, you don't know as much as you think you know. And no matter how much you think you know, God knows more. I said God knows more. And he's always right. If you believe in him. Okay, so, but, but with that being said, what happens is that the responsibility for my growth is, is based squarely on me. And many of you, I said this last week, I'm just doing a recap, I said this last week, many of us have come through church pipelines, for lack of a better term, come through church pipelines where they have taught us stuff that really doesn't do any good in life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, God help me. <laughs> You know, I mean, so if, if I'm taught that I have to dress a certain way to come to church, that ain't got no value to you. I dress like this because I am his son, his, his representative. And I'm not going to let some judge or some lawyer or some doctor look better than the son of God. You do what you want to do. I have to do what he tells me to do. So, but with that, things get added to you along the way, along life's journey, that simply do not create good harvest. I'm getting ahead of myself, but Galatians, Paul says over to the Galatian church, he says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. He's not, you're not going to make fun of God and show God to be wrong. He goes on to say that evil communication, what is communication now? Pictures. Com visualization, not just words, evil communication. I can sit there, you know, I don't want to name a show because I don't watch much TV, but uh, I can sit there and watch, um, whew, I ain't watch something, I'm trying to think, what have we watched that's bad or what have we seen that's bad? I pick on Andy Griffith because we watch, we do watch Andy Griffith from time to time. My wife and I are fans of Andy Griffith. I can watch it enough, and as I watch it, who, any fans of Andy in here? Some of y'all just too don't want to be identified, but it's okay. I'll take that for you. Anyway, anyway, it costs you nothing. But in, 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 on the Andy Griffith show, as wholesome as a show as it was, they lie all the time. <laughs> Watch it next time and see how many lies they tell. They lie all the time. Andy is always lying. He's covering for Barney. He's not telling the truth. He's trying to protect people's feelings because he don't want to, I don't want to hurt them. So in other words, he's telling lies. Now, with that being, I'm just using that as a silly illustration, but you get it. Evil communication comes forth from the Andy Griffith show, believe it or not. Because God says that we as believers, we as apostles, as disciples should not what? Lie. Come on, come on. Right? So if this is where things like, well, it's okay to tell a little white lie. I don't know why they didn't call it a little black lie. I guess I'm glad they didn't associate it with black people. You know, I'm just saying. Right? Ain't no color in this house. Y'all get that, right? I, can, I talk freely, okay? So, but, but, but it is, listen, but it is that slow, gentle turn away from understanding how important our words are that cause us to just kind of 
get lazy and complacent and, and just think, well, it's okay. And I'm submitting you to, that, to you today that it is not okay. Bible, the, the Apostle Paul teaches in more than one place. He talks about things like coarse jesting. How I many you know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever heard the term playing the dozens? Guess you have to be there, okay? Growing up, they used to have this game called the dozens. And it, the, 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 the uh, object of the game is to see how much you can outdo the person that you're going back and forth with exchanging words with to see how bad you can put them down. Y'all have heard this, your mama, yeah, okay, right? That's where that comes from. And we played the dozens. I didn't play because I'm very sensitive. You talk about my mother, I'm ready to fight. Please do not talk about my mother. So what happened, though, is what, when we get into those things, and I know this from past experience, somebody, it starts out all in jest. And by the time, because some people don't have an off switch, some people don't have tact and diplomacy and don't know when to quit. You know what I'm saying? Just let it go. Anybody ever been there? Some of y'all might be that person. I'm just saying. Somebody's going to get mad, and the next you know, something else is going to happen. Now, that sounds simplistic only from the standpoint that we're just talking about a name game. How about this one? When you grow up in a house, and your dad, he's your dad. It's Father's Day. Again, I say happy Father's Day, happy Father's Day to everybody. But that father might not have known how to be a good father because he didn't have a good father to emulate himself after. And this father, although well-intentioned, he might decide that you as the, maybe you got more than one if you're only child, maybe you didn't experience this. I come from a rather large family. I didn't experience this, but, but I can see it happening. I see it happening in other people's lives where that father, because he has low self-esteem in who he is, puts other people down, puts mom down in front of the children. Bad. I said bad. You ain't this. And all the while, when those words are heard, because I have not been trained to use my filter, the filter of, 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 of the Holy Spirit, really, but my filter in terms of me knowing who I am based on the word of God, that stuff just gets in me and it starts slowly accumulating in my heart and in my thinking. Yeah. Come on. You know I'm telling the truth now. Come on. Stay with me. Let's take it to another level, another relational level. Let's look at a woman who is being abused by a man. Now, not that there's not women that don't abuse men. But I'm talking about the predominant thing that happens. That woman, her self-esteem has been affected because that man, really, it's a manifestation of his own insecurity. You shouldn't have to determine your, your strength or your masculinity or your, your identification by putting your hands or your mouth on somebody else. I can't get no help in this morning. I have to recognize that those words, although they may be said about me, don't identify who I really am. There's only one place where you get real identity. Only one place. I did not say only one person. I said one place. Come on now. The one place that I get real understanding and identity is, say it with me, the Word of God. Some of y'all said that like you didn't know it, but the Word of God. Say the Word of God. So last week I was talking to you. I told you I'm just going to go through these because I want to get somewhere today. Many people have heard the Word of God by preaching, by teaching. Uh, and in general, most of these same people are still at the same place spiritually that they were at 5, 10, or in some cases even 30 years ago, right? And some of you know those people. Hmm. We're working hard to keep that from being a reality in this place. Amen. This is a tough place to come to church. I've said it many times. Some of you will leave here and never come back. But at least you were here. Yeah. At least you heard. Yeah. Some of you will come and come and come and grow and be a part. Thank God. The other thing I said and I, by the Holy Spirit is the problem in most cases with people who simply show up, and I'm going to say this again. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to say it because I just got it in my heart. And the Lord's been dealing with me about it all week. If, you know, I, this is, I've got a Bible here that I don't often use. It's called the, Jer the New Jerusalem Bible. And it is just what the word says, it, the name says it implies. It is, the, it is a Jewish uh, predominant translated Bible, okay? In English. Now, I've got this book. I've got how many Bibles I got in my house on, on my shelves? 
I got, I got Bibles. People give them to me. I collect them. I go find them. I got Bibles. I got all kinds of Bibles. So, and many of you do too. But how many of you know that just having the Bible doesn't do a lick of good? That's right. That's right. Has no value. As heavy as this thing is, it'd make a great paperweight. But the problem is that, but that the value of this is not just common knowledge. Most people don't know this. Most people don't know how valuable that is. And I'm going to show, to you, show you in just a minute how valuable God himself said this book is and the understanding of it because what happens is we are in a day and time where many of us are simply confused about what's going on in our lives and around us. I mean, it's a confusing time. But see, the Bible clearly tells us that he has not given us what? A spirit of fear. One place, one translation said a spirit of confusion because where confusion is, the Bible says there is huh? every evil work. So I don't, I don't have to run around here wondering. I don't have hair to pull out. And if I did, I wouldn't pull it out anyway. But I don't have to run, wonder when I see something that is out of line with God's word. Oh, my God. 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 Well, are you calling me or not, he says. <laughs> right? No, I'm saying, oh, my God, you got this. It looks crazy, but you got it. And I get my assurance from here. So just reading the word or just having a Bible is of no value, okay? Now, I don't want to get too far, but I'm going to tell you, this book is the most widely printed, widely distributed, most heated, debated book ever to ever come off the press. This is it, okay? You guys know that. Say amen if you know that. So just having it, just reading it is not enough. Come on. I would, if I polled the room and asked the question, most of you, most of you, I'm giving a wide latitude here. Most of you have read something from the Bible or seen it on your phone or your tablet, something. It may not have been a whole verse, might have been a whole chapter, but you've seen something in the past month. That's a wide latitude. If I started narrowing that down and said, okay, how about the last week? How about three days ago? When I bring it into last night, there's going to be less hands. And this is a good room. This is a good target audience, okay? If I did this, you know, at, at, a, at a, stood up at, the, at, at uh, Kinnick Stadium and said, okay, it's my turn. I want to ask the question. How many of you guys read your Bible this week? Who this fool? Right? Who let him in? So if I bring it down even further to say, you know, I won't say this morning because <laughs> you should have that covered. But, but the value of this thing is so precise that these words in this book is what is either good with you or bad with you. Let me say that again. These words in this book are either what is good with you or what is bad with you. And when I, when I say what is bad with you, I mean your neglect of these words is what your problem is. <laughs> testing, testing, one, two. Just got to make sure it's still on. Okay? Would you agree with me? Hopefully you will. So let's go through this. I just want to go a little bit further. Biblical meditation, I said this last week, biblical meditation is simply turning the word of God over in your heart until it produces revelation or spiritual insight. Biblical meditation is simply turning the word of God over in your heart until it produces revelation or spiritual insight. It's very important. Most of the people, listen to me, and I'm not generalizing uh, in, 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 in the sense, and I'm not saying anything prophetically to you, I'm just telling you uh, a fact. Most of the people that are over four or 40 or over, if you haven't gotten this by now, you're going to have to put some work in to get it. If you are 30 or, or 39, uh, again, wide, wide range there, but, and younger, if you can teach your kids how to meditate the Word of God, I'm telling you, they'll, they'll outlive you, and they will probably be more successful than you ever thought. Yeah. Okay. Teach them early. Next thing we said, meditating God's Word builds faith, which allows you to see with your spiritual eyes and hear with your spiritual ears in where? The realm of the Spirit. A lot of people struggle because they bring a natural mind in to try to understand what somebody is saying from up here. Right. Yeah. 
And if you don't have, if you don't have somebody up here who, who is anointed to do this, called to do this, and all they've got is just 900 degrees behind their name, but they don't have any revelation going on in their heart, it, it don't work. All right, I, I got to keep going. So. so meditating God's word builds faith, which allows you to see with your spiritual eyes and hear with your spiritual ears in the realm of the spirit. I'm going to give you hopefully a couple illustrations of meditation, just some personal meditation of mine on this week. The, the next one was what part, ask the question, what part does faith play in all this? You guys remember that? What part does faith play in all this? Well, faith comes how? By praying. Faith comes by praying. Faith comes by coming to church. Faith comes by listening to Life 101, whatever it is, point nine, whatever. Hearing. Faith comes by showing up at church. I mean, it, it comes by hearing. And listen, 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 look up at me. When I say hearing, given, given my first, first illustration about the containers, when God's speaking, he's speaking visualization to you. So, so you're not going to get the greatest amount of hearing on Sunday. If this is the only visualization you're getting, you're going to have a very, it's going to be a tough life for you. And you will leave stuff on the table that you should have accomplished in your lifetime. Everybody only gets one lifetime, ladies and gentlemen. There's no such thing as reincarnation. You only get one shot at this. It's more people spend more time trying to do things that bring attention from a, from a, from a crowd outside of the, of, of, the, of the kingdom of God. You know, everybody wants to be the, the great athlete, the great orator, the great scholar, the great this, the great that. But you know what? I want to be the best Tommy Roberts that God ever created. And whatever comes along in the package comes along because he added it, not just because, I, you know, well, I think I want to do this. Right. Okay? Yeah. So faith plays all the part in it. I gave you a couple of scriptures. I'm not going to go to them. I just want you to write them down. Hebrews 11 and 1. Hebrews 11 and 1. You can read that. Most of you know what that says. Now faith. Well, faith means being sure. Okay? Now faith is. And I told you this before. If, it's, if, you're, if you're a person that's still saying, well, I'm believing God for, and you fill in the blank, I'm going to tell you what, I hate to bust your bubble, be pretty direct, because I don't know the next time I'll see you. Like I said, some of you may never come back again, but I'm going to tell you the truth while you're here. If you are still putting faith in a, I'm believing God for a house. Now, I grew up like this. I grew up like this. So I'm not, not telling you anything that I haven't lived. Okay? I didn't read this in a book. I've lived this. I'm believing God that one day I'm going to have a new car. That one day will never come. Now, you say, well, I said that, and I got a car. But if you didn't use your faith to get it, God is under no obligation to keep you in it. I'm believe Listen, I'm believing God for a husband. And you meet this guy, and he likes you, you like him, y'all kicking it, and it's real sweet and real good. If God didn't give you that man, you better run as fast as you can. Ain't nothing worse than being married and being miserable. Well, yes, there is living together and being miserable and not being married. That compounds the problem. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. So what happens is what, happens is what, what God is doing is he's giving us the ability to find out his plan, and it's not hard to find. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you because I, I did this stuff. Now, the reason why I said that is because faith is always now. She read it earlier over Matthew, I mean, excuse me, Mark 11. Jesus concludes the prayer, the, 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 the illustration of what to do. He says, when you pray, you believe that you receive when you pray, not next week. Right. I'm believing that when I conclude my prayer, Father, what I asked of you, I've already got. I'm walking away knowing that it's done. Let's move on to something else. And oh, yeah, forgive my brother. Okay? So we put it, faith where it belongs. Faith belongs in the now, say it again. Faith belongs in the... Yeah. I'm going to show you why. Let's keep going, okay? Now, those are the things I gave you last week. Um, meditation builds inner strength to believe and the ability to hold on to what you believe. Meditation builds inner strength to believe and the ability to hold on to what you believe, okay? This is true. This is true. Now, Isaac... Everybody know who Isaac was? Yeah. I know there's some people that don't. Isaac, as the, the faith child of Abraham and Sarah, Abraham was how old when he had Isaac? 99, 100 years old. 
Dear God, if you had 99, it might as well be 100. Okay? It ain't one, it's 100. And Sarah was 90. <laughs> I know I got kids in here, so I'm going to make sure I say this the right way. Keep your mind up here. Don't take it down to the gutter. I'm telling you in advance, okay? If you can do that at 99, you are bad somebody. <laughs> Come on, we adults in here. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to have to be by faith. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know Sarah was like, you want to do what? We're going to do what? So when, listen, so when God said to her, I'm, I'm just kind of taking you along this path now. When God said to her, speaking, was speaking to Abram, what he was going to do with him, what was he doing? He was giving him visualization. And Sarah overheard it because she was in the tent somewhere. And I know she laughed like, uh, you, you, you what? Remember the Bible says Sarah laughed? Come on now, how are we going to do that? We ain't done that in 30, 40 years. But you want us to have a baby. <laughs> yeah, right. And God said, because he, he was so confident of his ability, not Sarah's, not Abraham's, that he said what was going to happen, and I'll be, it happened. Now, can I, can I ask you a question? Because this is, I'm trying to get transition a little bit. Did Abraham and Sarah have to do it? No, because you know how they didn't have to do it. Now they had to come together. But come on. <laughs> See, some of y'all are like, are we talking about this in church? This is where you need to hear this. This is where you need to hear this. Because this is the first identifiable miracle between man and God and saying that, you know, listen, God is putting you and I in a place where we, he doesn't expect us to do it. Amen. Most of us, I told you this last week, you know why people don't invite, invite people to church? Because they don't, they're not sure of what they believe. They're not sure. If, if I'm sure of what I believe, I got no problem inviting anybody to church, come to church. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before you get to church. We're going to have this. We're going to do this. Some people going to dance, swag down the aisle. You know, we're going to greet one another. You know, some people say amen. Some people sit there. You know, I mean, all this stuff is going to happen. Well, what am I doing? I'm telling that because I want to prep them to let them know so they can be off their guard, so they can just come with an open heart and hear what God's going to say to them. But see, the reason why most of us aren't more successful in the kingdom is because we think we got to do it. I'm telling you, it's already been done. When Jesus stood on that, was nailed to that cross, he wasn't just saying it is finished because, you know, because, you know, he, he was nailed to the cross. What he was saying was the completed work of why you sent me, the entire redemptive package is now complete, Father, because it is complete because my blood is, has been shed. And they didn't take my blood. I gave it to them because you asked me for it. You can't add to your salvation. Ah, I feel like I want to just, <clears throat> okay? How do you get this? You get it by meditating. Okay. John 4, 35. You just read it. I'm not going to go there. Jesus says some things about your eyes and your ears, your spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. Say amen to that, okay? Now, here's where, let me see. Yes, sir. My wife and I were talking the other day, and uh, we kept thinking, we kept, we were thinking about this, um, when God says to Abraham, he says, I have, now remember, he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Abram means the father of a multitude, okay? Loosely translated, that's what it means. Abraham means the father of nations. Why did God change his name? To give him vision. Let me see. Uh, come here, David. This gentleman's name is David Mack, Okay? If I change his name by authority that God gives me, he accepts the name change, and I say that you are uh, 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 um, Minister Mac. Yeah. Minister Mac, what happened when he heard it? He got an image of the, what he knows about a minister. Come on out. He may not know what that means. Raise your hand. We had this happen the other day, didn't we? Okay? We used the title minister with somebody, and it was like, oh, I don't want to be. But ladies and gentlemen, we all ministers. Right. The thing that helps bring it into clarity is him meditating on it, right. 
finding out from another source or from the one who called him that what it means to be, what did you mean by minister? Right? So what God does, he says to Abraham, Abram, you are now Abraham. Come here, Abraham. Abraham comes out. He stands where God tells him to stand. Just give me latitude here. He says, now lift up your eyes. He didn't say lift up your ears. He said, lift up your eyes and tell me if you can number all these stars. Now, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Look, look, come on. Now, you know the time frame. It was in the very beginning of the dealing with God and man, so the earth was in its infancy. But he's saying to him, look up. Now, now have you ever looked up at a, at a you know, we, I go sometimes I go up north in northern Minnesota with my brother there and other people. You go up and the skies are just clear. Can you imagine God saying to Abram, look now, and look, I dare a cloud to move in the way when God's telling somebody to look up. Amen. Come on now. There wasn't a cloud in that sky. There wasn't any pollutants. There wasn't anything blocking Abraham. And can you imagine Abraham looking like, oh, my God. You're telling me that this is what I see it's going to look like? Listen, he didn't even have a child when he said it. Wasn't no child. He's changing him from the inside out. Okay? Then he tells him, look down. My wife and I travel, you know, we like to go to uh, 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 northern Florida when we go on our vacations many times. Because, you know, I didn't grow up. I grew up where we had cricks and ponds. Okay? She grew up in an urban jungle. And so we found a beach. <laughs> We found a beach. That's what they call it. You ain't never heard that term before? Yeah, urban jungle, big city. Revelation. See, y'all got a revelation, see? Anyway, so, so when we go to the beach, we look, and the, and the beach we like to go to, I ain't telling you because I don't want to see you down there. One day I look up and see you. You find it on your own. <laughs> I love you. And so, the, but, the, but the, the beach is so pristine and beautiful. But it ain't got nothing on what God told Abraham to look like, look at. Wasn't no, wasn't no, wasn't no, didn't need no seashells. Didn't have all this stuff in it. I believe it. And even if it, even if it wasn't as clean as you and I might be able to imagine, how you going to number sand? Get a cup of sand and tell me how, how much is in it. Just, just one cup. Yeah, you ain't got no idea. So what is he doing? He's getting Abraham to visualize. And Abraham's like, the stars are one thing, the sand is another. He's changing what Abraham sees to be able to get Abraham to a place of believing. And I want you to say this word with me, trust. trust. Most of us don't trust God. I don't care how deep you are in this room. I don't care how deep, how spiritual. How you, most of us don't. Now, now, when I say that, I'm talking about to the level that God wants you to trust him. You might say, well, yeah, because you, you got to have a certain level of trust because you got born again. And those of you that are not born again, that ain't what I'm going to say. What you waiting on? you taking a real chance by not being born again. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm giving you information, whoever that might be. We had a young lady get born again last week. Woohoo! Praise God. But, but, but I'm going to tell you, you know, she's got to get information in her heart to be able to make this life work. And everybody ain't giving the same information. What I was going to say, and I'm still going to say it, because you, you don't have to like me because I'm telling you the truth. And you're a fool if you're not born again. That's what the Bible calls you. I'm just telling you. You got everything paid for. Why are you trying to pay for it too? And to be clear, you can't, be, you can't pay the bill of salvation, redemption. Your pockets ain't deep enough and your blood's not pure enough. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So let's keep going. Hmm. So you actually have to see and believe God's promises before, they are, before they're manifested. The word manifest means seen or revealed. Okay. All of the work, all of the works of God are based on the principle of seed time and harvest. All of them. Y'all really ain't going to like me now. Um. All of, the, all of the works of God are not based on your prayer life. I told you. You find it, you find it in the Bible, you tell me where it's at. Closest you're going to come is to what she just read over Mark 11. 
All of the works of God are not based on your prayer life. And I know people that have prayed. I know prayer, people of prayer, they pray, they pray. And I'm not saying pray, pray, prayer is a bad thing. No, I didn't. Don't go out there and say I said that. I didn't say that. But prayer has been put in a place where it is a communication with the Father. Communication is what? Two-sided. And if you're smart enough, you should be doing more listening than talking. Some people ain't figured that out. So when I pray, I'm listening to what the direction of the Father is. Let me give you something. You chew on this a little bit. And I want you to, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you to show me that I'm wrong. I'm challenging you. You do not see where Jesus, as a habit, ever prayed three times a day. You don't see it. You see in Old Testament saints do that. Middle Easterners do that. Jews do that. But you don't see where Jesus did it. Come on now. And we do things because somebody told me that's what I should do. Now, I'm not telling you that it's a bad thing. But if your prayer does not, does not move over into the realm of believing God when you pray, you spend a lot of time on your knees for nothing. Come on now. I'm trying to help you. So what did Jesus do? You will see more evidence that Jesus prayed somewhere in solitude away from the crew. He spent time with the Father. You know he did. Many times he would reference it. But he spent time with the Father. After his time with the Father, he went out and did the work. And he didn't, he didn't, first of all, everybody didn't get healed. He healed who God said heal. He touched who God said touch. He didn't try to touch everybody. Can you see how we get off course? Because we think we're supposed to, we think I'm, I think I'm supposed to minister to everybody. I think I'm supposed to get everybody healed. I think I'm supposed to bless everybody. No, you're not. You're supposed to do what he told you to do in the morning or, or whenever. Your morning might, you might be work third shift, so your morning might be different than somebody else's. But your time before God should always be with the understanding, Father, what is your will this morning? I'm looking at your word. This is what I'm hearing. I got it. Get up from your knees, go forth, and God just kind of makes things happen. Oh, help me, Jesus. Uh, uh, okay, okay, so let me keep going. So uh, when you meditate the word of God, you are actually sowing good seed into your mind, which will grow. I know I haven't turned to scripture yet. Romans 12 and 1, there's a good place to turn. Turn over there real quick with me. Romans 12 and 1. I'm going to show you how, how this works. I'm going to move forward a little bit. Romans 12. They'll put it up here on the board if you don't have a Bible. I encourage you to get one. I encourage you to get one. You got a car, you need a Bible. You got Netflix, you need a Bible. You got Pure Flix, you need a Bible. You watch YouTube, you need a Bible. You got a phone, you need a Bible. How you going to have all those things and not have a Bible? Well, my Bible is my phone. Okay, I feel you. My Bible don't need recharging, though. So I got both, and I use both when I go in my time with God. Sometimes that phone, people call me, I ain't fitting to answer it. And if I look and say, oh, I ain't talking to her this morning. Because <laughs> she's going to pull me right out the spirit. Can't talk to him. Oh, love you. Call you back. Come on now. All right, that's all right. Y'all get it later. Okay, <laughs> anyway, y'all all right? Can I keep going a little bit? Romans 12 and 1 says, I'm reading this from the New Jerusalem Bible, so it's going to be a little different than yours. I urge you then, brethren, re brothers, remembering the mercies of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, dedicated and acceptable to God. That is the kind of worship for you as sensible people. He goes on to say, do not model your behavior on the contemporary world, right? We shouldn't be acting like the contemporary world, but let the renewing of your minds transform you so that you may do what? Discern. For yourselves, what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and mature? Some folks don't, can't, even, they can't even make a mature decision concerning anything because their mind's not renewed. And so anytime you can't make the decision and, and you are the one who's leading or you are the one that's, it might, you just might be leading yourself because it might be just you. Without the word of God, you're subject to make a major mistake. People have done it. In jobs, they've done it in marriages, they've done it in the voting booth, help me God, they've done it in all kinds of venues, and they still keep doing the same thing because they have not submitted themselves to God. The best thing about God's word is it changes the way I think. 
We used to have a saying here that we're going to change the way you think about church. We haven't said it in a long time, but most of you, you know, this is a very unique place, specifically in, in this region. I challenge you to find some place similar to this. Because why? I, you, you've got to, you can't come in here and be dumber than, leave dumber than when you came. You have to work at that. I'm going to make that real hard for you. So what happens is the word of God is what transformed my thinking from all those words that I got about how dumb I am or how stupid I am or how broke I am. All these words I've been putting out there, throwing them out willy-nilly. They don't mean nothing, you know. I'm sick and tired. And you can't figure out why everybody in your house, every time flu season go, runs around, it just ravages your house because your mouth is too big. And you're saying the wrong stuff. Try it. Most of us don't even try it. Well, what should I say? Get in God's word. He blessed, our, the Bible says that he blesses my bread and my water and removes sickness and disease far from the midst of me. That's a better confession than saying, well, you know, everybody, I always get the flu. You stay over there, okay? You a flu magnet. I'm a health magnet. Y'all think I'm kidding. I, look, I, I got a good life. My, I got a good wife and a good life. You know what I do? Because I say that about her. She says it about me. You don't hang out with somebody as long as we've been together. You're going to have your spats. Oh, y'all, well, we don't argue. You're lying. If you don't, if you don't argue because you ain't talking to one another. Dear Lord, how you live in close proximity to somebody and not get on their nerves from time to time? Okay, I better get off that topic. All the husbands are like, please, 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 stop. Don't do that. <laughs> Wives are like, yeah, that's right. He don't say nothing to me. Ooh, boy, it's getting heated in here, man. Okay, let me show you something. I want to I I do this. Um, okay, so I want to show you something. I'm going to give you an illustration, and I'm going to talk to you about this guy. I'm, I'm skipping a lot, but that's okay, just for sake of time. Glory to God. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Okay, so... Yes, sir, I'll do that. Okay, I'm going to give you an illustration. Meditation takes, takes place in many different ways. Primary way, because I'm talking about, because you can meditate on stuff, you know, that, what's that university up there in, in Fairfield? Um, Maharish, right? Whatever. Uh, transcendental meditation, meditation, all that. Uh, it, it's funny. We had a young lady um, who was uh, uh, contacting us. Um, she was coming from another state, and she'd found our website um, uh, from one of the other ones that we're uh, affiliated with. And so she had gotten um, accepted in the doctoral program at the university. Now, she didn't know this, I don't know, but she didn't know what kind of university it was. And she was, she was a disciple, a believer, disciple, okay? And so uh, she, we would just email. We never met her because she never had a ch chance to come because she was trying to sort some things out. And, and she said, when she, she sent us an email, she said, when I got there, I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Because how many of you know... TM, Transcendental Meditation, is not the same as meditation in the Word of God. So, did she have it? Okay. So, so but, but with that, the wisdom of God is out there so you don't make major mistakes like that. I don't, I don't particularly like marriage counseling. For one, I'm not a counselor, but the state of Iowa says I am. I have to be because of my capacity. But most of the problem, when we sit down with people that are married, can be easily identified. Well, I should say two. Number one is, look at all ears perked up if you're married. All ears perk up, okay? If you're not married, you need to be listened to harder. <laughs> Number one is, the people come into it with an unrealistic expectation of their spouse. Yep. You can never change anybody. Right. You don't have the capacity. You know why I know that? Because Jesus, Jesus himself, the power of God is the only thing that can change somebody. Yep. So you think, well, I'm going to change him. He'll get better. She'll get better. No, she won't. Unrealistic. Say Unrealistic. <laughs> And then you spend most of your marriage or most of your time trying to get that person to change who they already were. They were already that before you married them. You should have found out. Right. Okay, don't shout me down because I preach good. Second thing, uh, the second thing is can easily be recognized in their lives is they spend no time in the Word. Yeah. Case in point, pull your religious toes in. If you don't have a Bible here, chances are you are not reading the Bible when you leave here. I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Here we go. How many of you have ever had 
a new car. It doesn't have to be brand new, but you got a new car in your lifetime, whether somebody gave it to you, bought it from a used car lot, bought it online, or brand new. How many of you have ever had that? Okay, raise your hands. That's just about everybody, okay? How many of you had an owner's manual in the glove compartment? Can you raise your hands? That's most of you, okay? Now, yeah, we're going to start separating some stuff here now, okay? All right. Now, with that owner's manual, how many of you know that that owner's manual is supposed to give you the ability to troubleshoot what's going on with that car? And how many, see, how many of you, rather than opening the owner's manual, either don't, took it out and threw it away, or just kind of left it there and they never opened it, but you'll take your car to a mechanic to get the mechanic to fix your car when it might be something simple that you can fix? Right? You feeling me? God's word is your spiritual mechanic. Yeah. It will fix what's wrong with you and I. Yeah. Oh, I ain't getting enough amens. I thought it was better than that. Because see, what God has done, he's saying, listen, Tommy, this is your problem. You, don't, you do try to do this stuff and you ain't consulting me. Let's, let's look at, let's look at, uh, um, pull your religious toes in. Let's look at, uh, um, uh, how much time I got? How much time I got? How much time? Okay. All right. Um, I got two minutes. Okay, she held two fingers. Okay, all right, all right. Like two minutes, man. I can't say nothing in two minutes. <laughs> Very little. I was looking at something the other day, and I was just kind of going through. Uh, I've been meditating on a personal note in, in John 17. Okay, how many of you know John 17, 17 chapter, 17 chapter of the Book of John, Gospel of Saint John, is really quote unquote the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know that? Some of you might not know that. It is not that other thing. You know, our Father who art in heaven, which is more than it. Very appropriate, but it is not. He's demonstrating what, what elements should be in your prayer. He's not showing you how to pray. Are you hearing me? More of you know that, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and you know that litany without even having it open. You just know it because you heard it. And how many of you know that is not what Jesus, Jesus didn't want that? That's exactly why he was saying it. Don't do this. Do this. So what he does in John 17 is he starts telling the people that can hear, he's talking to the Father, but he's not paying attention to them. He's doing it. This is what I'm saying. The public prayer of Jesus just before he goes to the cross is that, Father, I'm going to sum it up like this, make us one. As you and I are one. People say to me, why is it that the body of Christ, you know, we want unity, and why can't preachers get together? Because most of them do not believe in oneness. In order to get there, you got to meditate on God's word. So I began to meditate on that, and, and as I did that, I began to write some things down. This is where I pray for y'all at, right here. Right there. I got a, I got a, a list. My, my, our assistant keeps us with a list of people, names, and there's people on there who I haven't seen in months, in some cases years, but they still, they get prayed for right here. Are you feeling me? Now, here's another one. Because I'm meditating this, and I wrote some things down, but I... I I, I'm, 17 and 1 says this. After saying this, Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said. People always say, well, I don't know whether heaven's up or whether heaven's down or whether heaven. And you'll hear people say, well, heaven is really not anywhere. Well, it's got to be somewhere. <laughs> Most people that say that ain't read their Bible. Or if they did, they haven't meditated on it. Well, if, if the, listen, <laughs> if, Jesus sa- if the Bible says that Jesus lifted his eyes, then what's the point if heaven's not up there? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. He did, the Bible doesn't say he lowered his eyes and said, Heavenly Father. I'm supposed to look at his eyes. Yeah. Okay? That tells me something. Heaven's got to be somewhere around here. Yeah. Good place to start is up here. Yeah. All right. I'm going to give you another one. Can I give you another one? Deuteronomy. You don't have to turn it. Write it down. 28, 13. And then I'm going to finish up my last part here. De- Deuteronomy 28, 13. It is the place where we always hear Deuteronomy 28 quoted. If you've been around a church, a church like this, a word church, it details the blessing of the Lord through covenant people. Okay? So Deuteronomy 28, 13 says, I will make you the head and not the tail. Okay? Now, I'm, that's the only one I'm pulling out. That's the only one I'm pulling out. I want you to think about this for a minute. Remember that, remember that big black tailless dog I talked about a little bit ago? Here's what the Lord showed me this week. I actually shared this with somebody, but he showed me this week. Head and the tail, first of all, of what? A cow? A donkey? Horse? He didn't say. Come on now. Does your Bible say? No. Head and the tail of what? 
But it has, to be, it has to be something that is equated to having both head and tail. So it, chances are, 99.9.999%, it's an animal. What comes, to, what comes to your mind when you hear it? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. What comes to your mind when you hear head and tail? Made you the head and not the tail. Somebody just say something. You said front and back. Fly? Lion. Okay, lion. Ox. See all the different ones? Anybody think dog? That's what I thought. Now listen, now listen to me why I'm saying it. Thank you for your honesty. That's the first thing that came to my mind because that's the thing that runs around me that has a head and a tail most of the time, right? I don't have an ox or a lion in my backyard, okay? So, and all those answers are good and true. But, but then he said, okay, I said, well, why? The head and not the tail. Well, the head, number one, is where the teeth are. Need teeth? You know, can't do good with gums. That's why you get false teeth. Be gum- no, I'm serious. I'm not making fun. I'm serious. It's also the place where the sensor, the sensory, the brain is there. Isn't that cool? Okay. So I'm on the right end. I am equated with the end that can see. If you go to the flip side of this thing, the tail gets wagged. The tail has to follow. The tail is where the smell is. The tail is where the flies be. The tail is where that other stuff comes out that we ain't trying to go there right now because you got to eat lunch, right? That tail is working because it's trying to keep flies off the head. And if you are the tail, you are a follower, not a leader. God wanted his people to see, listen, you are not that thing. And, and I, I'm going, I got to throw this one in there because he threw it on me. So my wife's like, don't say this, don't say that. It's where dogs introduce themselves at, you know. It's where they find out whether or not you cousin Jojo or not, okay. I can't go no further than that. If you don't understand, then ask somebody, okay. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to be the tail. I have to clean my dog's tail. He got that little floofy, foofy, foof, you know, I got all this stuff going on. That's why I take him to a groomer because I can't. That, that's why I got to pull all the weeds. I got to clean that thing out. You're not that. No. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got that through meditating because when I saw the scripture, Holy Spirit said, think about this. Amen. You see how simple that is? Yeah. Now, don't lie. How many, y'all, how many of y'all thought about that like that before I said it? No, nah, you didn't. But see how easy meditation is? Yeah. Now when I go out here and I say, say, Susan, you are the head and not the tail. She's like, what that mean, Pastor Tommy? Let me tell you what it means. Let me show you what God. And I open the scripture to her. She can see that. A child can see that. You see the difference in meditation, just reading that thing and just skipping right over. And how many of you guys have read that before in your lifetime? You know you have. Okay? Do you see the difference? I want to show you real quick. I'm going to close with this. I'm almost finished. Joshua 1 and 8. Now I want you to turn there. I finally got to the word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Joshua 1 and 8. And I'm going to read this from this Bible. Thank you, Lord. Just a few scriptures here. Joshua, for those of you, I hear while you're turning there, for those of you who may not know who Joshua is as a Bible character, he is the, the chosen, appointed leader of, of Israel, of the Jewish nation, after the death of Moses, he has been publicly identified. We following you. Think about what you think about this now. We talk about meditation. He has been publicly. It's one thing for somebody to say that this is your new uh, varsity basketball coach. Okay? To, the, to, the, to, the, to just, just the basketball team. I'm going to use that one. It's another thing. You notice this. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's something like a coaching change or or uh, something of that nature, you know, something major, a football team gets a new coach, or a uh, university gets a new president, they, 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 make, they make it public, right? Because everybody needs to know who's running this show. Isn't that right? Yeah, a lot of fanfare, a lot, a lot, big deal. So, so with that as the backdrop, let's skip down to, um, uh, what verse? let's skip down to verse 6. He says, who's speaking? It's God, Okay. Be strong, he says. My Bible says stand firm. Yours might say, and very courageous, right? For you are the man to give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. First thing I see is God saying, I said I was going to do it. 
I said, I was going to do it. Now I need you to always know that I'm going to do this. Okay? So he had to be strong. He says, only be strong and stand very firm and be careful. Keep the whole law which my servant Moses laid down for you. In other words, now God is putting emphasis on what he needs to do. Most of us, whenever we do not open the word of God, it, it, it causes us not to know what to do. And I don't care the situation. doesn't matter what situation is. You, you and I, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you to the point now where we need to always know what God wants us to do. Okay? Not that you didn't before, but certainly not. He says here, do not swerve from this either to the right or to the left, and then you will succeed wherever you go. He's promising him, come on now, come on, come on. How many, you know, how many people in here aspire to be a life coach, you know? Or you're a life coach, you're a mentor of some sort. That should be just about all of us. You're telling people what they should do, how they should do it, do this, do this, and, and you know what? And somebody says, well, you know, I did that, and it didn't work, and all of a sudden, they're looking at you, they want to blame you. So you're careful with what you say. God is not careful here. He says if you look at this and you look at this both morning and night. He didn't tell him to read the whole law. He said look at it. He said just pay attention. Just look at it. If you would just look at it. If you just pay attention to this, you are going to be successful. I'm telling you that that hasn't changed since God said it. But how many of you know it is the hardest thing in this lifetime for us to do what he just said? Yes. Come on now. Come on. Come on. You Close your books. You, you can. I'm not finished, but I'm going to wrap it up. You can. You and I, ladies and gentlemen, we can make time for everything else that life demands. I wrote this down. I wrote this down. Uh, uh, it, it says, as, as I was meditating this, who... Who is waiting on the other side of the door of your obedience? Everybody has a door of obedience. Every one of us has a door. You got doors in your house. Most of you probably have two doors minimum. You got a front door and a back door. And those doors lead somewhere. Well, in in our Christian lives, our spiritual lives, we've got a door of obedience and we have a door of disobedience. And we spend more time going in and out of the door of disobedience and very rarely do we walk through the door of obedience. And on the side of the door of obedience, somebody else is waiting because they need to know how you do what you do. And the devil has tricked us into thinking that everything else takes precedent. Well, I read. Reading is not enough. I'm going to say it again. Reading is not enough. Reading is good. It's not enough. Because ultimately, you have read and read and read and read, and some of you know no more about the Bible than you knew when you first went to Sunday school. You couldn't share your faith. You couldn't tell somebody how the redemptive process of the cross really took place. You have no idea. And what you might know, you simply learned through YouTube or you, 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 you know, you, you might, you might've heard somebody else parrot and if they parroted it wrong, you won't parrot it wrong too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So he says, he says, have the book of the, uh, this book of the law, listen to this, always on your lips. I'm challenging you because life is going to bring these things that you should have known this a long time ago. Don't beat yourself up. Don't come under condemnation. At least you're learning it now. But it is, a, it, is a, it is a sad indictment against the church of the living God if we know to do these things and we don't do them because we simply are not sure that we believe that Jesus is coming back. Ladies and gentlemen, whether he's coming back or not, you certainly going to go meet him. Amen. If he don't come back in your lifetime, you're going to meet him. And you ain't going to be able to change disappointment. Can we reschedule this? Uh, your people get my people. And we, no, you, when your time to meet him comes, you need to have known this. He says, put this on your lips. What else does he say? Meditate on it day and night. Ruminate. Spend time. Turn the TV off. Take one passage of scripture, like I said, 28, Deuteronomy 28, 13, and get all you can get out of it, and then go back the next day. Read it that morning. Read it that night. Don't try to read the whole Bible. People say, well, I read the whole Bible in one year. What'd you get out of it? Well, you know. Huh. And don't, don't dare tell me, well, I don't have time. That, that excuse ain't going to wash. What you need to do is start being honest and say it's not a priority to me. Kind of like some of our church attendants. It ain't a priority. Work is a priority. Cashing that paycheck is a priority. 
Eating that food, because you already know what you're going to go eat when you leave here, is a priority. You know I know it? Because you went to the grocery store to prep, make preparation for it. I, I, I want to I tell you real, one, this last thing, and that is, listen, listen we, what we do is we, we over-spiritualize these guys and gals and act like, act like they were some, some dignitaries that I can't be like them. I, I, that was them. No, this is you, baby. In John 17, I, I'm getting a greater image of how much Jesus loves me. Ain't no distinction. I mean, how much the Father loves me. Ain't no distinction. He loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. I can prove that to you. He loves you the same way. Joshua. The name Joshua means salvation. That's what it means. Okay? Listen to some of the things about Joshua. You can close your Bibles. He was called to conquer a promised land and had been publicly placed and I mean, Joshua, he, he was serving alongside Moses. We all know that. But I have to believe that some of these things happened in Joshua's mind. Now, you give me some latitude. If you prove me wrong, that's fine. But I don't think you can, so I'm going to say them anyway. His mentor was more suited for the role, and yet his mentor struggled. Who's his mentor? Did Moses not struggle with these people? He struggled with these people. Right? He struggled with these people. And I had to believe Joshua said, if he struggled, what am I going to do? They showed he had miracles happen, and they still didn't believe. Now, Moses is dead. Gee, thanks, Moses. And you put me, and then you told everybody I was going to be this. You anointed me in front of everybody. Come on now, y'all think he didn't think that? He, there has to be a reason why God's telling him, be, you be strong. You have courage. You gonna, it's required of you that you have courage. Because these people are going to, what, what, what we would say in my culture, my African-American culture, they're going to work your last nerve. <laughs> You're going to want to hurt somebody. Right? And Joshua was a warrior. Okay? So, he saw, I believe he was Moses' minister, but he was not inexperienced. Right? He was in close quarter with, quarter, quarters with Moses. He had to know his strengths. And he also had to learn how to cover Moses' weaknesses. Now, he's got to say, who's going to do that for me? Have you ever wondered? Have you ever been there? You know, I hear you saying this, Pastor Tommy. I hear you saying encouraging, encouraging, encouraging. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate that. You know, but I find that thank God for, our, for a good wife and great sons and great family. But sometimes it feels like there's nobody there to cover my weaknesses. That's why we won. That's why I can't stand at the door and greet and preach the message too. That's why I can't drive the van and preach the message too. Because we're supposed to be one. You are accentuating my weaknesses. I am accentuating helping your weaknesses. That's how this works. Dude, did he know what Yahweh was going to ask of him? I wonder if he knew what God was really going to ask of him. God didn't lay the whole plan out in one time. God's never going to lay the whole plan out of your life in one time. If he did, you'd run the other way. If God had told me 20 years ago that I was going to be in Iowa, uh-uh, I ain't got no people in Iowa. I ain't got no plan for Iowa. What are you talking about, Lord? So he just waits. And as I meditate, and he slowly pulls me right on into it. And that's what he's going to do with you. going to pull you right to where you want to be. But you can't resist him, and you can't not make his presence or his word a priority. You will flounder for years. You will waste years. Don't waste years and years and years getting to the best thing that's ever going to happen, that ever happened to mankind. It is one and only the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is no better plan. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how many cars and houses you. I don't care. It don't matter. Because at the end of the day, it's all going to leave, stay behind. How could you not want to live for him? So, so Joshua was hearing all this. Do you not know Joshua was called to destroy, I mean, totally annihilate and exterminate entire people groups. There are people that once existed on this planet that you cannot find their ancestry lineage anymore because of Joshua doing what God said do. Think about that one for a minute. Some of them didn't do anything wrong. You can't find in the Bible where the Canaanites did anything wrong. Not, not when they encountered the, 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 the Israelites. And yet God said, I want them out of here. And it's your responsibility to kill them all. 
Make sure they die. Every man, every woman, every child, and their livestock. Everything. I don't want any more. To the human mind, that's like, oh, that's terrible. We got relatives right now that are hung up on the fact that God killed entire people groups. But God had a plan because he knew that if they did not die, they were going to contaminate the seed of righteousness. And that just wasn't going to happen. And Joshua's like, you want me to kill everybody? Oh, my God. You see how powerful meditation is? He don't get this picture. You know, as a weightlifter, I know you're weightlifting because I can see the muscles. As a weightlifter, you don't go up and snatch, you know, just do a, a, a you, everybody know what a snatch is? I, I couldn't do it if I wanted to. You know, you don't go up and do a clean and jerk or a snatch on 700 pounds and you can't lift 70. You're going to kill yourself or hurt somebody else, you got to get, listen, give me a vision, God, of what you want me to do today. And then as you give me this day, give me the next day my daily bread, and give me this day, my, and let me know what you want me to do with my life. And as it becomes clear, my God, you will walk such a path of focus and determination, nothing will distract you. Yeah, he was a warrior. He was, he was battle-hardened, man. He, he was there. He was a leader. It would have been easy for, for, I believe, it would have been easy for Joshua to be a dictator. Oh, yeah. He could have been one easy. You're the man. I'm the man? You're the man. Or you're the woman. I have that kind of authority? Now, remember, Joshua was the one who's out there battling. And all of a sudden, God showed up. And as manifested as an angel. He looked like an angel, but it was God. Had his hand, God had his hand on his sword. Joshua walked up on him and said, can I help you? <laughs> Come on. I'm, 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 but that's, in essence, what he said, are you for us or against us? Because yeah. God has given me authority to kill everything that's not for him. Amen. God wants you to kill everything that's not for him. Amen. Right? Listen, if you let some, people talk about generational curses so much, generational lines, if you don't, if you don't kill it, it's going to keep growing in your line. Yeah, that's right. Somebody going to, yeah, look, you know, if you, don't deal with the, if you don't deal with the pornography at this stage, somebody, one of your kids going to do it. Your daughter might be caught in sex trafficking. If you, look, you looking at them pornographic images, you just shut that thing off because you're sowing seed to somebody coming and doing something to your daughter. Oh, I know I'm preaching good now. I, it ain't like that. I just can't help myself because you need to get in the Word. You need to be strong and fully, fully courageous. No, you can't do it by yourself. But with God's help, the Bible says with God, all things are possible. Shut that thing down. Turn it off. Last couple here. Y'all right? Just come on. So he would, he, Joshua was not a priest. He was not a priest. He was a servant. He was a minister. He was a warrior. Come on now, there's a difference on time today. But you need a priest in your life to help you. Not a priest now, because now we've moved beyond that office and moved into that, the five-fold ministry gift that the Bible talks about from the apostle all the way down to the teacher. It is the reality of who we are. Somebody needs to be telling you something to help you grow. But now we got this mentality of individuals all about me. Okay? That's why we act crazy. Because we start believing that what we, the way we believe is right. I don't care what anybody else thinks. And it ain't got nothing to do with the word of God. And you just as deceived you, 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 and you're getting ready to hurt other people because of your deception. So he would, he, he would have to, he would have to see, he would have to give the order to kill these people. He would have to see many of his men, his own men, his, their wives and their children die. Many of the Jews died. He would have to... This was all in the package of saying, meditate on my word because you're not going to be able to do this because you're going to shrink back from it. Nobody's going to sit there and watch a child die and you come up and you're trying to handle this thing and you're trying to handle your natural mind and somebody's getting ready to, to, with a sword. You, look, you got to focus on God's word and know that this is a plan of God and no matter what it looks like now, it's going to be better at the end. Amen. He knew. He said he knew he would have to fight against rebellion. We're fighting against it today. I got ministers rebelling against God that I know. Stand up and preach this thing and you rebel against God. 
can't figure out whether they're going to come and don't know who they are anymore because they ain't in the book. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. And then, then when they get up here and they tell you this stuff and they're not living this stuff and yet there's, there's no, where's the power that's supposed to be in the church? Where is the deliverance? Where is the anointing? Where is the spirit of God? It's there. But the spirit of God does not run through just one person. Everybody in this room is anointed to do the will of God. Everybody has a responsibility. That's why Jesus prayed that. Make us one. Make them one as you and I are one, Father. But you got to know this. Glory to God. He, he, would have to, he would have to fight against insubordination. People deceived. I can do it my way. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way. And if you are on a path that leads out of the way, many times the devil's job is to make sure that you don't know that you're on the wrong path. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the ends thereof are death. In other words, if I had known that the street, the bridge was out, if somebody had told me that the bridge was out, that the highway had been washed away, I wouldn't have gotten on this road. But I'm on the road now. I got to get off the road. But when the people are standing and telling you, and stop relying on a GPS that don't work. The GPS says, as in all things, make sure you do a reality check. The bridge is not there. Amen. Every way doesn't lead to God. Come on now, Allah is not God. Muhammad is not God. Buddha is not God. There is only one true and living God. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jesus. But if you don't know it, you ought to get off, get off, get, get off that path. It does not lead to God. But now we got a bunch of weak, wimpy, yellow belly, got no backbone preachers. And men and women of God who, who just will simply just, it's like the lemmings, man. They just all follow each other off the cliff. <laughs> One of them lemmings need to say, whoa, don't push. <laughs> Last one. He would have to conquer against those who would attempt insurrection. He got people on the inside fighting against him. And he's trying to get them somewhere. That's what Moses encountered. That's why Moses, you know, Moses is like, come down from off that mountain, getting ready to bless. See, just all this uncleanness and unrighteousness. Have y'all lost your minds? I have to believe Moses said, Aaron, what are you doing? They got the priest of the Lord deceived. He's building them a idol, a false god, a golden calf. Come on, somebody. And all of a sudden, everybody's dancing around this false image. The church is dancing around things that don't have real substance. I'm telling you what I know. And expect, oh, well, they running 10,000 over there. I don't care if they run running 150. If God is not there, they are wasting their time. Moses came and the Lord told him to do what to the rock? Moses went. Oh, wham! <laughs> Lord, didn't, Lord didn't lose his cool stare at your feet. Lord simply said, because of that disobedience, you go no further. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you what I know. Here's the prophetic word of this message. Still talking about seeds. We'll get to it next time as God gives us grace. But I'm going to tell you this. Listen to me well. Don't tune me out as you get your bags and stuff together. Listen to me well. Many people trying to figure out why the power of God isn't in churches anymore. And they try to say, well, it has to do with the music and it has to do with sin in the camp and it has to do with this. No, 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 no. Listen, put all that stuff aside. Those things might be true and they do have some leverage and they do have some, some genuine, genuine uh, 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 substance to them. But they are not the main thing why God has not done what he's desiring to do in his church. And because now he's getting the job done. And that is because his people have been way too disobedient. Okay. I'll make them sit down a minute. We, we, we have, we have, we have, listen, we have taken this, this, we have taken this, you know, okay, oh, sir. A large root of this thing started with the, the feminist movement. Now, you just have to trust me on that one. And when men stop being, it's Father's Day. When men stop being recognized for their value, they began to be devalued and, and their esteem slowly ebbed away 
man was not some afterthought of God. You got women now, I don't want a man, don't want a husband. I can do better by myself, not according to the word of God, you can't. You ain't supposed to find him. Let him find you. I'm just telling you what the word says. You do what you want to do. That's what we do. That's what we're talking about. Disobedience. And somehow or another, and we see God doing things that seem to be working, and then all of a sudden, boom, I can't get any further. I can't get any further. I can't, I, I, I want to see, but I want to see the miraculous. I want to see the awakening. I want to see the overflow. I want to see revival. And God tells you to do something simple, and you don't do it. And it affects everybody that's connected to you. Everybody. You can say, well, no, it doesn't affect me. Read your Bible. When, when, when Joshua and them had a victory, they were getting victory after victory after victory after victory. And they ran up against one of the, the smallest tribes. They had a battle in Ai, of all places. Small. Supposed to be, psh, what is this? You know, like, 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 like. Uh, a professional football team, the New England Patriots, pa playing the Iowa Hawkeyes. I know you don't want to hear the illustration, but that's true. Smear them all up and down. This is supposed to be, this is easy. Look, we'll, do, we'll, put, in the, we'll put in the second special teams unit and let them beat the tar out of the Hawkeyes. And the Hawkeyes kick their butt all up and down the field. That's how that was. And all of a sudden, it's like somebody, Kirk Ferentz got to say, or, 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 or the, the, what's his name? Bill Belichick got to say, what happened? We're supposed to win this. They said, well, you know, half the guys last night decided they're going to go out and live like the world. Half the guys didn't. They just decided they don't show, won't show up for practice except when they want to come. Half the guys decided, well, you know, some of them didn't even dress out. Same thing is true about the church. Aiken, he started finding out, and this is, this is what Joshua had to do. He had to find out who did this, what happened. He knew something was wrong because we're always supposed to win. Found out somebody was stealing, keeping stuff that were supposed to be destroyed, hiding it under their tent. And God said, I'm going to tell you what you do to the disobedient. You call them all out right out in front of everybody. Line them up. Line them up! And tell them, how dare you? You hinder the work of God because of your deception. All of a sudden, the earth opened up. The entire families were killed. Not just the dad. The entire family line is hurt and hindered by your disobedience. Men, y'all need to stand up and be men. Stop letting your wife make all the decisions in your household. Stop being pushed around by the world. Get up and pray. Get up and say something over your house. I'm the priest of my house, not her. It's my wife. She works alongside of me. But bless God, ain't no devil in hell going to come up against my house. I'm going to be standing right there in front and say, I double dog dare you. Something starts shoving against my family, I'm shoving it back. Something starts manifesting in my house, I'm pushing it back. I'm not doing it by myself, but I got God pushing, pushing it back. Sitting, trying to run up in the church, I'm pushing it back. Lift your hands. We got to give a gift to you too. Father, in Jesus' name, by your great mercy and grace, Lord, we receive the understanding and the revelation of the power of meditation. You have made us the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. I pray right now for these, your hearers, your beloved, as the word hits them, don't let it bring condemnation or guilt or fear. Let it bring clarity. Let it set the course for the success that you promised Joshua to be in our lives as well. The promise to him is the promise to us that then we would find good success. Then we will be prosperous. All that is in the package of what you've given us. Today, we've spent time in your presence through the, all of the components of this service. Thank you, God, for the attentiveness of your people. I thank you, God, that when they leave this place, they're going to be blessed in such a greater dimension because the Spirit of God is going to move in every house represented. Even if they don't know what it is, it's going to be something different about their household. It's going to be something different about their lives. It's not going to look the same, not going to be the same. And I pray great grace and strength upon every man and every woman who is looking to a man to get the job done. Hallelujah. Vision come forth now. In Jesus' name, can you give God a hand of praise? Would you do that?